Guys, welcome to episode three of Quick Out the Blocks. I'm your host, Sheena Quick, and I'm joined by none other than John White. I'm pretty sure everyone in the Detroit area knows him. He is like a title machine, but I met you as the creator of The Black Athlete. Can you explain your vision and just your progress of, of, um, of developing this brand? My vision for The Black Athlete was just to give, uh, you know, The Black Athlete something to be proud of. Um, something they can take pride in. You know, if you look at everything across the board from Nike, Adidas, to all the major shoe companies, they're represented by the majority of black athletes. You know, they make their brand go. Um, Jordan, you know, how he took Nike from, you know, at the from the bottom of the, uh, I can say the totem pole all the way to the top and the rest is history, you know, with him, you know, being, being a black athlete, you know, so. I just think um, I just took three words that people use every day um, and I branded it and never thought that, you know, it would take off the way it did. Um, started with a book. I wrote, wrote a book um, that I looked at the final of my book cover and I said, you know what, I'm gonna put this on a t-shirt and the rest is history. Put it on a t-shirt and it just grew because it's, it's really, there's no limits to the black athlete. Um, it's so, it's so such a wide range of things you can do with it and, um, just continues to grow daily. So how can you like how long has this been in the making? Like was it did it start as a pet project? You know, you mentioned your book. How long did it take you to write it? Well, it took me to write my book maybe a year and a half. Um, because I wrote it, rewrote it, um, edited it, re-edited it just over and over again. Um, then one day I remember it's probably like four o'clock in the morning when I finished writing the book and I literally I started crying. <laughs> I started crying, you know, because it was a, you know, it was a, a milestone and a and a goal of mine to reach. And I, I did it. And man, that's when the black athlete was birthed. And it's crazy, Sheena, because I remember when I was writing a book and I was telling a friend, I was like, I'm going to name my book, The Black Athlete. Yeah. And she was like, for what? Why are you naming it The Black Athlete? You should, you should name it something different. Now, what if I would have listened to that, that individual? You know what I'm saying? What if I would have listened to her and just, you know, and follow her and heed it to her instruction or her opinion, you know, but I believe it was God given um, and uh, the fruits of it, you know, you know, speaks, you know, speaks to that. You mentioned something. You mentioned that a friend asked you why the black athlete. I would say um, it's interesting. I'm pretty sure BET got the same thing, you know, black entertainment television. You, you get people saying, well, what about white entertainment television? Black people would be offended if you did that. Why is it that we have had to kind of shy away from proclaiming our blackness because it's seen as like pro possibly negative or limiting? But I will say this right now with what's happening in the country, your brand is everywhere. You have people from entertainers to athletes to just regular everyday people who would have shot away from being too black. Now they're proudly wearing it across their chest. How does that make you feel? You know, it's humbling. It's humbling. Um, I don't take it for granted. I don't. Uh, it's actually, it humbled me, you know, in a great way because, uh, you know, it, my mom, you know, I don't know if you know, my mom was a, a pastor. Um, I grew up in church, you know, all my life. Um, I'm in ministry. So, um, I always think about the story of Saul, you know, when, you know, he lost his place as king. And, and I remember that uh, Samuel was telling him that, you know, you was all right as long as you were small in your own eyes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, so that it almost made it just stay, you know, stay small, but still, you know, pursue the goal and the vision. Um, it, it makes me it makes me proud, too. You know, even when I seen um, when I seen Manny Love, you know, that plays for the Harlem Gold trying to, you know, he sent me the picture and he don't see any with the shirt on standing in front of uh, the courtroom in Manhattan. That was dope. That was dope. Um, even seeing Rashid Wallace at the All-Star All -Star game, um, interviewing Quavo with one of my shirts on. Like, you know, it, 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 things like that still blow my mind. Uh, I don't even think it really hit me yet. It sunk in how, how much it has grown yet. Um, because I, I believe I still have so much, you know, so far that it's so much farther to go uh, but it's it's humbling and you know it makes me proud now when when you talk to the friend and she was you know trying to suggest that you name the book something else um 
how are you able to stand firm in that? Because like I said, right now, everybody is proclaiming their blackness. I'm black, I'm proud, you know, I'm blackity, blackity, black, I'm a black athlete. <laughs> it hasn't always been that way. It really right. hasn't. Like, you know, like I said before, it's almost like you have to diminish your blackness or your self-awareness to make other people feel comfortable. And you did it at a time where it kind of made other people feel uncomfortable. Like, did you have any talks with your other um, family members or friends that, or did you just already have that inside yourself that was like, look, this is what I'm naming this book. This is what I'm going to name this brand. It is what it is. Whoever is offended basically needs to check themselves. <laughs> right. I mean, when I, um, when I wrote the book, when I came up with the, uh, the title, I just remember sitting in my house, um, when I was writing a book, I write, I write at late at night. It'd be one, two, three o'clock in the morning. I'm just uh, writing because I think that's when my mind just, you know, I'm decompressing and things just flowing. So I was writing. I just said, the black athlete, the black athlete, just a kid trying to make it. That's the black athlete. The black athlete is just a kid trying to make it. So um, I wrote that. And, um, and like you said, a lot of people, you know, they was uncomfortable with it. It was a, like you said, it was during the time where, you know, people didn't want no smoke, as they say. They ain't want no, you that know. Was perfect, yeah, yeah. They ain't want to walk out and, you know, amongst white people and with a black athlete shirt on. It's almost like, you know, blacks would dim their light and cower down or be ashamed of who and what they are. And I, I never understood that, you know. And it just, you know, it, it bothers me. Even to today, it bothers me. Like, man, you black. You know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. you're black, you are who you are, you know, before you even got here. So, right. yeah. And it's so funny. The first time you sent me a um, black athlete shirt, well, you send it with everything that you, that you um, every piece of clothing that you send out. And the literature, the piece of literature that you send, it just stuck out. To, it stuck out to me because as black athletes, even though I'm not a black athlete anymore, a decade plus removed, but what you said was true in, in the literature because to be a black athlete, you have things that you have to overcome off of the field, off of the track, off the court, and you have to you have to overcome probably double what a white athlete has to overcome. That's what makes the black athlete such a unicorn. So mm -hmm. I thought that was very very interesting. Um, even like just wearing my black athlete stuff through the locker room, I would see players kind of like they want to ask about it but they're kind of nervous. You know, you have, you know, the PR people are there. You have the other media members, which are like 98% white. And uh -huh. I might get a DM about it later, but there's, they were still at, at that point last season, they were still a little, you know, a little hesitant to just be like, so, you know, what's up with the shirt? Where do I get one? But I would get mm -hmm. the DMs privately. Right. So I, I think that's, that's very interesting as opposed to right now, if we were to go into a locker room, which I don't think we will for, if we have an NFL season, um, I think that this year you you would see that well, not even necessarily Eric Reed because he always speaks his mind, but you would see more people able to and more comfortable with voicing their interests or you know, like like you said earlier, just embracing their blackness and who they are. Mm -hmm. So I think this it's just a very interesting time that we're living in. I mean, it's lit, but it's scary. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah. it's definitely. Um... You know what I mean? It, it, it's it's, it's like, yes, we're finally coming together with a plan. You know, it, it's, it's an interesting time to be in. How is that for you? You know, you're a basketball coach, very successful basketball coach, and you're in Detroit, Michigan. How has that been in, you know, being on the ground, on, on the forefront and on the ground level of that? Um, you know, it, it's it's funny because um, the Black Athlete, when I, when I started the brand, um, I outfitted, I literally outfitted 15 schools in the Detroit Public School League. Nice. So they, they, they was wearing my, um, they was wearing the shirts, the shooting shirts that say the black athlete on it. I think that really started the movement, movement, movement in the city. Um, just last year, it's funny, uh, one of the coaches tried to wear my shooting shirts in the game. And he got a call and they told him to stop wearing the shirts because it's offensive. But said, that's what's on the court, black athletes. <laughs> Nothing but black athletes, especially in the, the PSL, which is, you know, Detroit Public School League. That's mm -hmm. all that's on the court. Um, and so they asked me for literature. They wanted to know what the black athlete was about. You know, what is it? And I gave them all the literature. And, you know, I think a lot of people, even blacks, they have to be educated. Like, why? And my thing is, why do I have to educate you about us? You know, about yeah. 
what you know what what your son or what your daughter is yeah. um so it's a uh, it's um it's one of those things that you know it, it just still racks my brain let me jump in there to say guys it's not you know divisive the black athlete brand is not divisive i've seen athletes of all of all races wear this shirt it's not like you're discriminating because a lot of times your brother and your sisterhood is with a white athlete that's on your team or a teammate that's on your team mm -hmm. whereas if they did not have that experience of playing on the team with you their scope of what you're going through might be that much more limited right. you know like i've had even even like i'll say this with media <clears throat> of course sports media is predominantly white men but what i found interesting even before this you know i have white female colleagues that always reach out to see how my me and my boys are doing especially if there's you know some police brutality brutality they're like hey you know she's checking in on you and the guy you and the kids you know to see how y'all are doing but without having been in that same space that might not be some something that they would be comfortable doing if they just saw me in a passing passing type of manner so mm -hmm. um i will say i will step in and say that it's, it is the black athlete it is centered around black athletes but it is not divisive it is very welcoming to all who want to learn more to be allies mm -hmm. and things like that so please don't look at it as being only for black athletes this is just right. a vehicle that is moving through right now Facts, and you know i got a, um i got a call from uh, one of my good friends actually one of my best friends she's the associate head newly associate head coach at xavier um, university and um and she I, they want me to do a diversity training you know for the athletic program you know so um i think that that's pretty dope because you know it's, it's all like you said it's all about being educated um you know people really not knowing understanding the sensitivity or right. you know how to interact or deal with black athletes and you and they in coaching and they still don't understand you know you know how do i deal with this situation you know when i'm dealing with one of my kids you know that's that same kid you went and recruited and you sit in their living room, sat in his living room, you know what I'm saying? You didn't really understand the scope and, you know, of everything that, that goes on in his, in their lives as a black athlete. So I think that's pretty dope. It is. I remember you telling me about that opportunity. I think it's an excellent opportunity. Hopefully you're going to take them up on that. But, um, Oh yeah. I told my do it. So we just, we're just trying to set a date. Um, Cause they want they actually they want the basketball team to be in a part of it too now so it gotta be sweet and what you said about you know these these um white coaches that go and sit in the living rooms and they're talking about taking your child to the next level how excellent your, their program is how edu you know how great the school is education wise and this that and the third but you don't ever rarely if ever hear them talk about how they're going to help your child mature into a young black man or a young black woman because the truth of the matter is outside of that uniform and off the court they live a much different life Thanks. and um that reminded me of the first time i covered march madness it must have been it was in 2017. i had to go down to south carolina for um the game i want to say it was was it south it was the university of south carolina was 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 playing there duke was there um maybe Carolina. I don't remember all the teams that were there specifically, but it was in um, Columbia, South Carolina, Columbia. Anyway, it was in South Carolina. It might've been Greenville because it was supposed to be in North Carolina, but we had the, um, the bathroom issue. Mm -hmm. you, re you remember that? Like the gender, the gender yeah. bathroom yeah. deal. I want to say it was H H one B something, something like that. Nevertheless, I'm down in South Carolina and I'm driving up, took my kids with me. There's Confederate flags outside. Confederate flags outside of this arena, but it's like 90% black athletes playing inside, but you see all the white people ushering in to come see them. And it's because right. being an athlete, being a black athlete, you're looked at differently by the masses. You're looked at just from an entertainment standpoint. And um, a friend of mine, Vash, I heard, she did pose that question to, you know, the South Carolina head coach. It's like, you know, and, and he's actually a minority also she was like you know how how does that how do you do that how how do your players have to walk past these confederate flags and basically put on a show and so right. he, he had he made a very profound statement of being inclusive you know his wife i want to say was black at the time i'm not sure if they're still married whatever but it was just it, it just put an interesting spin on things that you know like i said earlier the black athlete has so much to deal with often on the court and that was the most jarring example of it 
for me is that you see these Confederate flags, but you have to walk past these Confederate flags and represent, you know, pretty much they would represent the state of South Carolina. They're right. at home. They're not traveling down to Mississippi or Alabama, Louisiana, or anything like that. They're at home in South Carolina. So how can you applaud them on the court but hate them off of it? Hate them off of it. That's it's that's something. Off of it. It's that's it's something. weird. That's that's and that's 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 the crazy thing about it. Like you could cheer for somebody one minute, the next minute you call them, you know, the N word or you know, you sp trying to spit on them. Um, you degrade them. Um, like you said, Jay-Z said the best. He said, all we got is sports and entertainment until we even. You know, and that's, you know, that's that's such a true statement because we dominate those industries, but yet we still not appreciate it, you know, for right. our hard work, you know, you you know for every, everything we do. Time. Yeah. And that's what brings us to the next topic of this pilgrimage back to HBCUs. I know how you feel about it. Um, you know, like, like you said, a lot of these, a lot of times these coaches can't relate to these men because they are, they, they've never been black men. They don't have to mm -hmm. do that. They're the same person on the court and off the court. They're able to amass generational wealth off the talents of these black men and their silence in some cases was completely deafening during this latest black lives matter movement which prompted or reprompted, I'm sorry, reprompted the initiative of bringing top talent back to HBCUs as opposed to these PWIs. And we're seeing, we're seeing it as baby steps, but we're seeing some top talent either transfer from a PWI or you're seeing, you know, like the guy make, Maker. I'm, not, I'm probably mm. his name My cool, my cool Maker. Yeah, my cool Maker. You're seeing him go, going to Howard and he's one of the top athletes in the country you're seeing mikey williams alluding to him going to himself going to an hbcu how realistic do you think that is and, and what what do you think the time frame would have to be because of course it can't be done in just one season mm -hmm. do you think that there is enough um how, how would this be sustained past this moment in history right now that we're currently living in how do you think that'll be sustained and what kind of time range do you think we're looking at to really see an impact on this this pilgrimage back to HBCUs. I think I think um, it starts at the grassroots level. I think it starts with the um, kids being educated about HBCUs, the black the black athletes being educated um, from their coaches, high school coaches. Um, some of these kids play for white you know white high school coaches. Yeah. You know, so they need somebody um, that's going to teach them about you know the history of HBCUs, the richness of HBCU. I didn't go to an HBCU. Um, I got recruited by Howard. I got recruited by Howard, but I wasn't educated on what an HBCU was. I'm like, man, I, well, I ain't going to Howard. You know, I'm going to Howard. You know, I didn't know. Like, I did. I'm from Detroit, and I didn't know. You know, I, I wasn't. Um, you know, I wasn't abreast of the HBCU because you know we were always caught up in that. We was, you know, as young, you know, my generation, you know, our generation, we was caught up in the uh the tv and you know it's what TV. what school's playing on tv and you know this you know it was it, different but now you know when you understand when you when you know better you know what i'm saying you try to teach others you know what i'm saying you know from your experiences so i'm 100 percent for the hbcus time frame i can see it happening um all you need is that one you need that one that one match to you know the strike and it just starts that whole you know what I'm saying, that domino effect that happened. But, um, you know, my best friend is a head coach at HBCU, you know, Lindsey Hunter. He's at Mississippi Valley State. Um, so uh, I'm with it. And he put together he, – he's – man, he done put together a team, you know, for next year that's bananas. And, you know, it's just – you know, he, he's riding the wave, you know. Um, and, you know, I, my thing is this. If you got a guy like Lindsey Hunter, who's a two-time NBA champion, 17-year NBA veteran, he's a head coach at an HBCU, if you don't believe he could develop you, and he was a lottery pick out of Jackson State. So he's somebody that played at an HBCU and was a lottery pick, a top-10 pick in the NBA draft, you know. So he won championships with Shaq, Col Shaq and Kobe and then came back and, and won one in 2004 with the Pistons, you know, when they beat Shaq and Kobe. Right. So, you know, we always laugh about that because I always tell people I'm a Detroit Laker, you know what I'm saying, and, you know, and we always laugh, man. I, you know, I tell them how they cheated. But, you know, you got a guy like that that's coaching 
at a HBCU, he could develop you. He could tell you how to, you know, have longevity in the NBA. How do you know sustain yeah. a long career? And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, there's tons of HBCUs here in North Carolina where I grew up. Mm-hmm. You know, you had I'm, I'm from High Point, so right in that vicinity in the Piedmont, you had Winston Salem State, you have A and T. You have um, Shaw and Raleigh. You have St. Aug and Raleigh. None of them recruited me. You have Central and Durham. I wasn't wow. recruited by one HBCU, not one. And I knew the head track coach at A&T. He saw me run all summer because he was an AAU coach. And he goes, well, I didn't, you know, I just didn't think I had to recruit you because you, you know, you're in our backyard. You're like family. And I'm like, why don't you think you have to recruit me? I'm beating everybody on your team in high school. Like we're lining up in, in blocks and I'm blasting your girls. But I will say this, um, I think that you, you mentioned something, you mentioned Lindsey Hunter and his resume. I mm-hmm. think that that's ultimately what it's going to take to be a sustained effort. People want to learn from the people that have been at the level that they're trying to get to. You know, everyone right. is in Lavelle Moton. Everyone is in the Lindsey Hunter. But the more Lavelles and the more Lindsey's that you get, at the helm of these programs, I think the more you'll see this top talent come consistently come in and not feel like they're giving anything up. That's the biggest thing. Because these are still 18 and 19 year old kids. You have to make it worth their while so they don't feel like, well, I'm giving up Duke and I'm giving up my, pop, my you know, possibility of a future. Now I will say it's a little different on basketball court versus football because basketball, the individual talent shines through much easier than football when there's 22 people on the field. Right. You know what I mean? And you have to, at the running back, you got to hope that the offensive line is doing their job and, you know, they're, they're pancake blocking and things like that. You have to make sure that your receivers are running routes to open up the inside lane for you. But in basketball, if you're just a baller, you can be on a horrible team, but your talent will still shine through. So I think that realistically, the, I think the initiative will be more effective on the basketball court. And right. until you get, you know, Super Bowl champions and things like that at the helm of the football programs, then they'll start to come. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I mentioned a and and their track team. Now, at the time that I was being recruited, they had a, a, you know, historical coach by the name of Spaceman. Spaceman has since retired because, you know, I'm old and all. But um, <laughs> now, <laughs> well, lately, they've had Dwayne Ross. Ironically, Dwayne Ross, used, he was, he's an Olympic World Championships hurdler. He trained with my hurdle coach at NC State. And so that's how I knew Dwayne. But when Dwayne took over that North Carolina that um, North Carolina A&T track program, boom, they're tops in the state. When I say tops in the state, better than NC State. And, and you know, it hurts me to say it, better than NC State, better than Carolina, better than Duke, you know, better than Wake Forest. And these are our four, you know, ACC schools in North Carolina. And A&T is dominating them. You know, they're, they, they had, they're, they're putting kids in the top 10 at NCAAs. They're, they're making champions. I mean, like, consistently because they know – Dwayne has done it. Yeah, he's, he's actually he's, – um, he's been all there in Detroit. He got one of, our, um, one of my students from Detroit Renaissance. Dine, yeah. Dine's down there run track for him. Yeah. She, ran for, she ran for Track Life University. And actually, she, um, her high school coach is Darnell Hall, who won the uh, Olympic yeah, gold medal. Good too, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah Dwayne, Dwayne is not playing like he's look, these kids are for going NC State and the ACC and they're going to Greensboro to run for ANT. I think that is huge. And although it's a non revenue sport, it's huge. It's putting people in, it's putting kids into the pros. Right. If I had to do it all over again and Dwayne, I could be coached by Dwayne, I wouldn't have mind, I would, I would have considered ANT. But I think what we have seen in the past is that these smaller HBCUs don't feel like they can compete with the Dukes and the Kentuckys because of course there is another side of this that does not get talked about. The elephant in the room. It's the money. It's It's the the money piece. It's the fact that you're going to be watched on television. It's all these different aspects that all these different, you know, um, parts of the equation that I think some people may miss out on. Cause I'm like, look, you got to remember, these are 18, 17, 18 year old kids. Right. That's a lot of responsibility to put on them to revamp the HBCU platform, but with all hands on deck and making kind of those steps in the initiative of getting the big, getting the experienced, not just big name, the experienced big name coaches 
and you know probably getting some more you know interaction from the boosters and things like that and you get the the make them occurs and possibly the mikey williamses and then boom you and you in the game because mm-hmm. like yeah. zion zion could have went anywhere he could have gone right. to state in south carolina and went to south carolina state he was still going to be zion but then there are some kids that need that coaching at the they need their game to mature they actually need college to mature as opposed to right. being one and done and i definitely think that that's the niche that you want to you the hbcus want to to you know recruit from yeah and you know and the scary thing about it you know you get guys like coach moton you get guys like Lindsay hunter you know they coaching at that level it's like all right now nah, you don't want nobody coming in and snatch your coach from you you know you know, yeah. give them a give them a payday they can't turn down that could that could change their lives you know because they're family men you know that's a little side of it yeah so it's 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 a business it's a business piece to it so um that's where you have to give them the tools you know what i'm saying to be successful at a high level at a high level at you know for a, a long period of time you know what i'm saying um because Lindsay, you know he's like i said he's down there he's building you know coach moton his his resume speaks for itself, man. You know, the man is doing it down there. He's doing it, you know, um, at a high level. So it's, you know, it, like you said, it's the money piece. Um, you know, like you said, you you didn't get, it's crazy you didn't get recruited by the HBCU down there. You know, I think a lot of that has to do with confidence from the coaches, you know. Right. Confidence and belief that, you know, well, you know, they not going to come to us because we, we look, well, when you think it's small, you're going to get small, you know at the end of the day, you know, so, you know, you, you know, you got guys like Moten and Hunter and Lindsey Hunter, man, they just believe that, you know, we could compete with these guys, you know, right. these dudes, you know, they, they get in line just like, you know, anybody else, they could get in line. So I think that's what it is. It's mostly, it's just a confidence and belief that, you know, you can compete at a high level. What I think is also huge is Chris Paul, who did not go to an HBC. He's from, you know, my hometown area too, where it's, you know, it's Salem State and it's the A&T. And he went to Wake Forest. He stayed, you know, he stayed home, he stayed local, went to Wake Forest. And we've seen what he's done in the NBA. But the initiative that he has taken now mm-hmm. to putting HBCUs, you know, at the forefront, making them highly right. comfortable, that's going to be huge also. That's going to be, that's going to be really big. What, I felt a little bit bad about this year. It really sucked that COVID came and canceled the first ever HBCU combine for the NFL. Wow. That was going to happen um, down in Florida. That would have been dope. But of course, with COVID, you know, Deion Sanders was on board. I mean, every, like, everybody knows it's no secret. Primetime is like my favorite NFL player ever but, <laughs> because he ran track and because he went to Florida State. But right. um, I thought that was huge. I thought that was really, really big because with the NFL, you know, like I said, it's, it's much different than the NBA. When you're mm-hmm. in the NFL, you know, you, you want to go to the combine. Those are the top prospects. Not all the prospects at the combine get drafted, but most of them do because you're right. in a concentrated atmosphere where people are getting to, you know, look at your skills and this, that. And the third, if you're at an HBCU, you're already not on TV as much. You know, A&T, they keep winning the Celebration Bowl which right you know, they, i mean they thrash everybody but um that's the only really te- that's the only televised you know game they have and that's in january that's 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 facts you know that's all in january so you're already not getting the tv exposure i remember asking ron rivera about you know them not recruiting Tariq cohen out of out of a&t charlotte's right two hours i remember away from Greensboro, two, two hours. And he went to the he went to the bears right he went to the Bears and has been balling, was a pro bowler in his second season. So I asked him, he's like, well, we didn't, re-. he was honest. He said, we didn't recruit them. He was like, it's a, it's a visibility thing. We don't get to see them play on TV. So I think that that combine, I mean, he was honest. I mean, they have enough scouts to send phys- to that, physically beat it. And that's what I was about to say. You talking about TV. Y'all, y'all the NFL, you don't need TV. You know, you really it's, don't. You really it's, don't. A saying, it's a saying that somebody can play, you're going to find them. You know, so it's a matter of them doing their due diligence. They they let one slip through the cracks on that one. Yeah, they let a lot slip through the cracks. Not not just specifically the Panthers, but the NFL, a lot of NFL teams in general, because these kids are from smaller schools. But the combine, the HBCU combine, was going to be it would give them an opportunity that uh, that they've never had before. And so it really it, that's the sucky part of COVID. <laughs> it also hurts that you know these kids didn't get to have a pro day. 
Right. A lot of a lot of a lot of athletes that in last year, the year before, the year before might have gotten, you know, signed as an undrafted free agent at least. All they have to go on now is 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 film and hoping that their their college coaches are sending this film to the correct scouts. And I mean that's kind of the I guess the downside of the coronavirus, I mean, I know there's tons of them, but that's one of the the major effects of having to be quarantined and, and all travel being stopped. And it's, it's just, th it threw everything into a tailspin, which, you know, is unfortunate. But I was excited. I was going to go to that. Yeah, that would have been, that would have been, that would have been a lie. What, uh, what part of Florida was going to be in? I want to say Miami, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. That'd I want to say it's going to be in Miami. But it was, it was, I was excited because that's, it's unprecedented. It's unprecedented, which brings us to the NFL. Mm -hmm. And um, Pat Mahomes got paid yesterday. Changed the game. You'd love to see it because he, although he's biracial, you know, he's black. He's a black quarterback. Of course. And we just saw the year of the black quarterback. You saw um, a black Super Bowl MVP, mm -hmm. black MVP. And you saw a black rookie of the year, all three black quarterbacks, a position that historically we were thought to not be able to do because of the, you know, the IQ, the football IQ needed, which is, you know, that's, which is a prejudice. De you, definitely, definitely a prejudice. I mean, the MVP definitely was somebody prejudice. that they were trying to turn into a tight end because he was fast and athletic. Unbelievable. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it just used to, even when people were saying it about Cam Newton, it bothered me because I'm like, where else does an athlete get judged negatively for being athletic? That, that's just the craziest thing to me. You'll see, you know, oh, well, Cam Newton stays hurt because, you know, he's running. But then they're like, oh, well, Mitchell Trubisky, you know, he, or, or Josh Allen rather, not Mitchell Trubisky, I'm sorry, Josh Allen, you know, look how many rushing yards he has on rushing, you know, it's just that quarterback position is the main that's that's the the one position that I would say above all else, it's just it's a racist position. And Cam Cam's gonna kill it, and he's gonna kill it in uh, New England. I mean, Cam like, videos make you want to run through a wall. I'm trying to tell you, it's going <laughs> he's he's about to he's about to take it to another level in New England because he can run and he can throw. I mean, I think he's gonna be good. I think he's gonna be good. Um, man, they that was a steal. That was a steal. Yeah. I mean, it really, really was. I mean, but when you're someone like Cam that wants to just prove that they can still play, the money uh -huh. is not that important at this point. It's not about the money. This is somebody that feels slighted. You know, yeah. um, there's a whole generation of Panthers fans that the only thing they knew, only Cam Newton was all they knew. You know, and, I mean, yeah, he did. Did he go 15 to 1 one year? Yes. Year the super the year they lost um, the Super Bowl to the Broncos Peyton Manning's last year. I'm gonna say it's Super Bowl Fifty. So this is a man that me judging from my perspective of seeing him in training camp, seeing him at practice, and seeing him on the field like you know face to face and things like that. Before he got hurt in 2018, he was on pace to surpass his his MVP season. He was on pace to surpass that. Mm -hmm. and got hurt. It's funny how soon how soon they forget, you know. Well, that's how soon they, they forget. Not for long. NFL average career is th three years. It's a what have you done for me lately league. But Cam Newton and um, the video he put out recently said, you know, he's done being humble. You know, of course, <laughs> I posted people like, what do you mean being humble? Blah, 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 blah. Because no matter how much the media trashed this man, he did not speak out against them. That is difficult. Just think about you get online and people just talking trash about you. Like, it's right. only so much you can take. You're going to be like, look now, yeah, one more time, you know, before I go off. But then he gets recruit, he gets signed to New England, and now we hear about Cam's philanthropy. He's always been that way. He's always been philanthropic. He's, his seven-on-seven seven league has put several people in the NFL. There's mm -hmm. NFL players that played in his seven-on-seven. Seven. His seven-on-seven seven league is completely free to the parents and athletes. Wow. That's huge. Trust me, coming from a, a sports mom, it is expensive. Right. I used to play several sports, and I got, you know, two that are back-to-back. -back. Aiden is four. He's going to be entering that next year. You know, 
God, God willing that that COVID is gone. But you know, you're spend you spend thousands of dollars. Right. I mean, I'm sure you know AU basketball and things like that. You spend thousands of dollars on the registration fee, the equipment, the gear, the travel. There's so many different costs, and these kids compete free, free. Right. right. Then, then the extra stuff your kids want. You know, so <laughs> the little extra stuff they want to throw in. I need this. I need this. I need. Oh, yeah. so. we, we provide that. That's all Under Armour. That's Please right. And so, you know, feeding the families in thanks during Thanksgiving here in Charlotte, um, the the Christmas give backs that he does. I want to say he gave away like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of gifts last Christmas. This has been Cam. This is the person that you know scores a touchdown and hands the hands a football to a kid that you could possibly ha handing him that football could change his whole life. Right. He said, I right. Know, I want to be like Cam Newton. I want to play football. Da, da, da. So now I got to get my grades right. Yeah, I mean, you just never know. The smallest act can really, really inspire someone. And I felt like his exit from Carolina could have been handled better for sure. But on a national media scale, he's never really gotten his flowers. You get, true. they get so upset when they see, like we said earlier in this conversation, being unapologetically black has been frowned upon. And so that's what I think everyone's issue that has an issue with Cam Newton. Oh, he's this, he's that. Look at the way he dresses. Fitzpatrick did it. Remember right. when he wore the Jackson drip and everybody was like, oh, he's so dripped out. He's so cool. Cam does it and you're comparing him to Medea. Like, or saying that that affects his performance on the field or affects him as a man. You're calling into question his sexual, just all of this stuff. And I know that's part of being a superstar is that you're in a fishbowl, but I just, I think it is very interesting for people to be so bothered that someone's being unapologetically black. I need, I just need Cam. All I need, I just need for Cam to bring back the, bring the dad back, you know. That's he another need, thing, you know. He need to bring that back in New England. Like, you know, the end zone celebrations, the posing and stuff like that, that was, that was from the 2015 Panthers. Uh, all day, all day, that you was know, all day. So I, it's, it's just gonna be interesting to see, um, to see him in New England, we get to figure out if it was Brady or if it was Belichick. That's going to be interesting. Wow. So I'm just hoping that football comes back. Hopefully people wear their mask and, and it can come back the way it's supposed, or at least in a limited capacity. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be, you know, stadiums full of fans. I'm, I don't know how they're going to do that. But um, mm -hmm. it's just one of those things, like I said, being unapologetically black really unnerves people. It's weird. It's, it's I don't I don't I don't get it like weird. you know and, it's crazy and Patrick Mahomes he doesn't shake the table he does he's an anti-black he isn't ignoring his black side or anything like that but to see him get that payday I thought was big I think to see more black quarterbacks start to get more guaranteed money that's what I want to see that's what we need to see to shake up the system because mm -hmm. For those of you guys who don't know, NFL, I, you can be misled by the word contract. You and I think a contract is legally binding. In right. the NFL, there's all these little incentives where you might see that somebody got a hundred million dollar contract, but like 25 of it is guaranteed. The other 75 is you have to make the Pro Bowl. You have to have X amount of sacks, you have X amount of touchdowns, fewer than such and such interceptions. You have to have so many rushing yards, so many receiving yards, so your your um your target percentage has to be a certain. There's so many different little attributes that you have to do to get that money and to make mm -hmm. the contract actually be valid. So we're seeing more guaranteed money. And years ago, I was, you know, do you think this is going to change the quarterback position or da da da? And and the long and the short of it, from people that are very, you know, close to the league, were like, black quarterbacks ain't about to get that. And I'm like, you think so? I know so. So it's, it's just interesting. I'm really glad to see um, Mahomes get that payday. He deserves it. He's an amazing talent. Why, why so I, just, I just got excited and I just got a text. And I, got a, <laughs> I just got this seven foot kid coming to my school. So I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. That's, you already have a seven footer, don't you? I got two of them now. I got a 6'11 and a seven footer now. So it's, it's, <laughs> it, just, it just changed the game for me. So he makes three. Two it makes two. I got a six, six. I got a, I got a six eleven seven foot, six seven kid, six five kid. You and know, I got a, six seven seems to be the magical height. Yeah, and I got a, um, I got, I got three, I got three high major guards, um, three high major. And they all young, like sophomores, 
And um, so I just got excited. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, <laughs> I just got excited. So that's what I'm yeah. excited about. And I'm excited that you joined me today. I've always wanted to pick your brain. I said, this is long overdue. We are running out of time simply because, you know, after a certain amount of time, people stop listening to your podcast. Right. But I definitely got to have you back on because there's so much other stuff to talk about. Like oh, what, what's next for the black athlete? Well, what's next now? Um, I'm trying to, I, I got a movie script for my book. Uh, finish the movie script. Um, it's complete. It's, it's done. Oh, um, yeah, Randy <laughs> Randy Holloway, who's the uh, executive director for Fox 2 News here in Detroit. He helped me put together the script. Um, I did a lookbook for it. So now I'm just trying to pitch it, you know, I'm trying to pitch it, you know, especially in this downtime, you know, or the COVID, just trying to hope I could, you know, get somebody to take a, at least take a look at it. Um, so it's, that's the movie, The Black Athlete, the movie. I'm working on the second book, The Black Athlete, Volume 2, Just a Kid Trying to Make It. Um, so Amazing. excited. Anybody this is the, the character of the book. So give you an idea. It's going to be a girl. So nice. It's going to be sweet. So guys, any um, producers or anyone that you know that knows somebody, make sure you're checking out theblackathlete.com, especially when it comes to the Black Athlete movie. It's definitely a project that you're going to want to get on board for. And in the meantime, John, tell everybody how they can follow you. You can follow me at uh, Instagram, at the Black Athlete, um, as well as Facebook and Twitter, all at the Black Athlete. So. Um, and also, you can go to my website, www.theblackathlete.com, for any merch you want, book, merch, all things The Black Athlete. Amazing. And your, and your mask. You're doing masks as well. Because they yeah. seem like they're going to be here to stay for a while, guys. So make sure you, you, you got your Black Athlete gear, your Black Athlete mask. Thank you, John, for joining us. This has been Episode 3 of Quick Out the Blocks. I'm Sheena Quick. You can follow quick out the blocks on Instagram at quick out the blocks or on Twitter underscore Q O T B underscore. Um, my personal Instagram and Twitter are Sheena underscore Marie three. And until next time, guys, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time.